So do you feel like you've been flying into space now? It's kind of dreamy music, yeah? Well, we are continuing with our fun summer series today, which our series is uh, May the Force Be With You. And we're basing that on the Star Wars epics. Do you know there's nine of those movies? Nine of those movies. And they were done in a um, series of three, the three trilogies that they had. But the first one starting in 1977, 42 years ago. So 77 to 83 were the, I know, right? They're 77 to 83 were the first three. The original Star Wars, A New Hope, The Empire Strikes Back, and The Return of the Jedi. And we, of course, it touched on all three of those already this month. And then they went to the prequel, the one, the stories before those stories happened, where we got to meet some, or get to meet some of the characters in their early, early youth. And uh, The Phantom Menace came out in 1999, The Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith. And now they're completing the sequel trilogy, the sequel at the end, and um, that's The Force Awakens that came out in 2015, The Last Jedi, and the next one is next December. 2019, so something else to look forward to, one more Star Wars movie, right? Yeah. Again, 42 years is just amazing for that to be in our culture and our consciousness. So um, today we're going to be looking at one of these. We're going to look at the first one, and it's called the very first um, in the storyline, if you will, which is called The Phantom Menace. And um, my talk is releasing your Phantom Menace. So we'll discover what that is. But let's see how this starts out. We've run the crawler for each one of these every week. This is the crawler for the original movie that sort of sets the tone for what's going to happen. So that's what's happening. Any of that sound familiar? <laughs> yeah, all right. Kind of spooky. I know, kind of spooky. Turmoil, dispute, deadly battleships, greed, debate and the good guys, the Jedi Knights, coming to the rescue. So lots of political turmoil, and it's certainly a familiar storyline for us that we see in this, this uh, movie. And when I looked at it, and it's like, well, what is it really about? What are they really trying to tell us in this movie? What's the real theme of it? Because it's a very long movie. It's like two and a half hours long. So it's a very, very long movie. And you probably recall that character that they first came out with when they were promoting that called Darth Maul. He was a Sith Lord, and he looks like everybody's nightmare of the devil, doesn't he? Yeah, he was just really, he was red, and he was black, and he had horns and all sorts of stuff. So he was really a scary character, and that's how they were promoting the movie. But in fact, he's not the bad, bad guy, is he? He's not the real phantom menace in this show. The menace is really referring to Senator Palpatine, whose involvement is that he is a dual character in this. He is the senator on this little tiny planet, because you kind of wonder, why would they start with a little tiny planet to blockade it? It doesn't really have any resources or anything. But it turns out that he had been setting this up like an undercover agent for a long, 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 long time. And he was a well-respected senator. He had befriended the queen, had her trust. And in fact, he was, what's his name? um, Darth Sidious. Darth Sidious was his name. And you probably remember him later on as the emperor, the guy in the shroud. He was the, the master of Darth Vader, of the dark side. Remember? So this is the first in the whole series of events, and this guy was there at this point. And one of the things they reveal in this movie is that the dark side, the Sith, had been extinct for centuries, and were just beginning to come back as this movie began. So (coughs) the film, like all the Star Wars movies, of course, has lots of great action, exciting battle scenes, great spiritual wisdom of those Jedi that are woven in throughout it. But the, the idea of phantom, we've all had ghost stories, right, and phantoms, and it's kind of scary, and they had that real scary character in there. But what I really begin to look at and understand in this movie is that it is boiling down to our ability to triumph over our own fears. It's our ability to triumph over our own fears. And we've seen this throughout this series, haven't we? It's really a setup of the good and the the evil, the light and the dark, the light and the dark side and all that. 
And this one is really no different, but it really does have a lot to do with that inherent underlying fear that we can sometimes feel. So today I want to take a look at fear. I want us to take a look at what fear is and discover maybe some of our own phantom menace that we may have within us and how we can maybe release some of that. How we can maybe release some of that. Ernest Holmes, the founder of Centers for Spiritual Living and the author of the text that we teach from called The Science of Mind, he tells us that fear blocks the more complete givingness of the spirit to its highest form of manifestation on this planet, which is humankind. He says fear arises from that mental attitude which limits the possibility and the willingness of spirit to give us the good we so greatly desire. There's nothing wrong in the desire for self-expression. God is more completely expressed through the person who lives largely than through the one who lives meagerly more expressed to the one who lives largely than the one who lives meagerly. And we're here to express the magnificence of God individualized within each of us, aren't we? Because only you as an individual can express spirit as you can express spirit. No one else can express like I do or like any of us do. We're all individuals. So we we have to show up in our own magnificence to do that. Now, we see a great example of this in the show with the young Anakin Skywalker. Anakin. I keep saying Anakin. Anakin Skywalker. But in the show, he's only nine years old. He's a little kid. He's a little kid. And I'm going to give you a spoiler alert in case you haven't seen it. Anakin grows up to become a Jedi Knight. And the... The... Um, he... The father of Luke Skywalker, remember we saw him in the first one, and Princess Leia, and he goes to the dark side, and he becomes Darth Vader. Yeah, I know. I'm glad you all knew that. So um, in the show, he's working as a slave child, though, in this first movie. He's a little kid. He and his mother have been enslaved on the planet of Tatooine, and he is there, and he's going to help rescue, actually, Obi-Wan Kenobi, who is about 20 years old, and he's just getting trained as a Jedi Knight. Remember, he was the senior knight in the, um, the previous movie that we talked about. And he's also with his mentor then, Jedi Knight, Kegon Jinn, which is played wonderfully by Liam Neeson, by the way. And the great thing about the character of Anakin in this is that even as a nine-year-old kid who is enslaved, he knows exactly what he wants. He is absolutely confident and extremely brave in sticking with his dream, his desire. He knows beyond the shadow of a doubt that he not only wants to be but will be a pilot. That's all he wants is to be a pilot. So much so that he has built what is called a pod racer because he wants to learn to fly and he's sort of teaching himself to do that. Nine years old, okay? Nine years old. And a pod racer is like a hovercraft kind of thing that has a couple of engines and flies really, really fast. And so he's been building this thing, trying to to race in the races and stuff. He's also built a droid that he calls C-3PO. And uh, he built this to help his mom. So he's a nice guy too, right? He built it to help his mom around the house. So he does end up being able to race in the race. He wins the race. And um, he is able to secure his freedom through that. We'll talk about that a little bit more. But he is living largely, nine years old, a slave. Living largely, living his dreams, working on his dreams every time he's not working in the parts store in town. He's working on his pod, his pod racer. He's working on his dreams. He didn't allow his current circumstances to limit his future possibilities. He didn't allow his current circumstances to limit his future possibilities. So my question for us today is do we have the dedication to stick to our dreams? Do we have that burning desire within ourselves to stay with our dreams, our desires, and our goals? To allow spirit to be more completely expressed through us? Because that's where the desires come from, right? 
they come from spirit all creation comes through spirit from spirit through us and that's what makes us want to do things but then this thing called fear goes whoa I can't do that couldn't possibly open a spiritual center y'all know that journey right it was a it was a faith walk it was a well, fear and then faith walk yeah yeah but it can be so easy to allow that fear to control us can it so easy but sometimes we don't call it fear do we sometimes it shows up as procrastination sometimes it shows up as distraction I'm too busy or I don't have enough money or education or whatever the I don't have enough is in that bucket right and that I don't have enough of or I, 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 I can't work on that today that's something I'll work on later something I'll work on later we can be very good at making excuses in our life for playing small. Justify it, don't we? Justify it. And excuses and blame are the phantom menaces of our life. Excuses and blame are the phantom menaces of our life. And excuses are just what? An attempt to justify the decision. Right? I made a decision. It may or not may not be a good decision, but I can give you an excuse and tell you exactly why I did it, maybe, right or I can justify it in some way rather than maybe just going wow that was a harebrained decision look at that and as Ernest Holmes said in that quote learn from it and move on right learn from it and move on but sometimes we get committed to those excuses we get committed to that the other part of it is blame and that's trying to assign that responsibility to somebody else they did it, those people, they make me feel this way. Right? Only we get to choose our feelings, don't we? Only we get to choose our feelings. It's really easy to push that off and blame. But what I've noticed in my life is that I look around it and I, I observe others in judgment or blame or, and things like that. And I don't have any energy around it. I don't have any attachment to it. You ever done that where you're going, wow, they're getting all worked up about that and I don't, I don't have anything on it. You can see it. But then I see me do the same thing when I do have some attachment about something. I do get wound up about something. And I can go into that blame. Yeah, but, yeah, but, you don't know what they said. You don't know how they treated me. Right? But we get to choose our responses to those things, don't we? And if we don't be mindful, as our Jedi friends say, if we're not mindful of those types of thoughts, those thoughts can then begin to run us. Almost said ruin us. Maybe that's true too. Maybe that's true too. So where might a phantom menace of excuses or blaming be hiding in your beliefs, your thoughts, or maybe your words? or even your actions. Because they can be in all those places, can't they? can be in all those places. They can be in the words that we say, can be in the actions that we take. Ernest Holmes, in Living the Science of Mind, another book that he wrote that we use here frequently, says, there is still another fear which is at least as great as the fear of death, and that is the fear of life. Have you ever heard that? The fear of success is as strong as the fear of failure? Yeah, we sabotage, don't we? We've talked about that before. He says the fear of people, the fear which comes from, is the, and the fears that come from sensitiveness. In many ways, this is the worst fear we have. I don't know if there's any way of weighing and measuring it against other fears, but I cannot help thinking there is no fear greater than the fear of life itself. Yeah. And I think this is sometimes where we can maybe get a little entangled in our teaching a little entangled in the science of mind because we all have hopes and dreams and goals and desires that we're always working on in our life don't we we're always working on something we want a little more of this or a little less of that just continue to balance out our life experience it's kind of the natural way isn't it as we grow and evolve oh well, that served me but it doesn't anymore so i need to let some of that go or this I, i'd really like to experience more of that 
And that's just the dance of life that we do in continuing to try and balance this experience to our greatest joy, to our greatest joy. But that's where our entanglement can occur because, well, I really, really want that, but I'm really, really, really not wanting to do what it takes to have it. I'm not willing to make the commitment. I'm not willing to have the discipline. I'm not willing to take the classes. I'm not willing to fill in the blanks, right? And that's usually what stops us. There's some fear in there of making that commitment of doing that whatever we need, know we need to do to accomplish that change that we want to receive. There's some fear we're kind of bumping up against maybe. Some fear we're maybe bumping up against. Or it could be the other side of it. This no longer serves me in my life. I know this no longer serves me in my life. Closets, clothes, right? Yeah. I, I know I haven't worn that in three years, but I'm not going to let it go because I might need it someday. Or I'm not going to let go of that habit or addiction or whatever that might be that I'm experiencing because who will I be if I don't have that in my life? How will I show up? How will I show up if I don't longer have that? Holmes is clear in the teaching, very clear in our teaching, that we're only limited by our own beliefs and that we live in a, lo- a universe that loves us and supports us. It's always got our back. And that goodness is the foundation of life. Goodness is the foundation of life. And we know that just as the emperor chose, he was trained in the light, wasn't he? Because he knew the Jedi force. But he chose the dark side. He chose to step into the dark side. And the same is true with us. We can choose whether we want to be in blame and excuses or whether we want to choose the light and growth and expansion. And one of the really neat things that we know in our teaching is that we have this little law called the law of reflection. Isn't it fun? <laughs> Because what we can do is we look around our lives. If we want to know what we're thinking about or how we're behaving or believing, we can just look at our life and see what's being reflected back around us and go, wow, I created that. (laughs) I'm pretty powerful. So that's one of the things that we get to look at is looking at our choices, our thoughts, and our beliefs in the reflections of the things in our life and that we surround ourselves with. So I want to ask you to, if you're choosing to walk through the fear, are you choosing to walk through the fear? Anybody remember that Marianne Williamson quote? The one where she says, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Yeah. Our deepest fear is that we're powerful beyond measure. It is our light and not our darkness that most frightens us. I think so. She goes on to say, we were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us, but it's in everyone. Not just in this room, but everyone, everywhere. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. Do you know that? As you shine, you light the path for others around you. Giving them permission. That's why we love to follow people that are charismatic and people that are successful is because they're shining that light and we have a belief within us that says, if they can do it, I can do it too. If they can do it, I can do it too. Little kids want to be baseball players and football players because they see the big guys doing it and they know they can too, right? It's within us all that we know that. She says, as we let our light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. That's such a powerful quote to remember. When you get into fear about taking a step and doing something, think about the example you're setting for someone else by doing that. Think of the example that you can set for someone else by taking that step. And we see it demonstrated in the film so beautifully when Anakin is asked to step through his fear. Nine-year-old boy is asked to race in the most dangerous pod race that they have. And there's one guy in it, a, a 
an older creature, <laughs> I couldn't call him an older man, an older creature, who really wants Anakin to fail and is out to get him and tried to sabotage him. And throughout, the, it's a very exciting race with great animation and stuff that they've done with it. But Anakin overcomes and wins that race. Now, he thought he was just racing that to win the money that um, the Obi-Wan and them needed to get the parts to fix the ship so they could leave. That's why he thought he was racing. What he didn't know is that they had also negotiated for his freedom as part of that bet so that if he won the race, that Anakin could go with them and be trained as a Jedi Knight. But he didn't know that part when he went into the race. Do you think it would have made a difference? It maybe. His fear could have come up, couldn't it? His fear could have come up in that I'm going, I can't leave my mother. I can't leave my home planet. I can't leave this. I can't possibly go. I, I. Can you see how fear could have come up and sabotaged that for him? Could have. Could have. So spirit expresses through us, as us when we can step through our fear and trust that process. Trust the force. So let's move into our practicing the principles this morning and see how we might be able to release some of this menace of fear that we may have in us. Now, I do have to tell you that every time I said the word menace during the week that I was preparing for this talk, I really wanted to talk about Dennis the menace. It just seemed like... But it just didn't fit in the Star Wars talk, so we'll have to find something on Dennis later on. Our first principle this morning is um, Kegon Jin said to Obi-Wan Kenobi. Now remember, Obi-Wan is the youth and Kegon is the master Jedi. He says, be mindful of the future, but not at the expense of the moment. Sound familiar? Yeah. Jedi can see the future, but he warns the young Anakin that you need to remain in the present moment now. Yes, you can see the future. Keep an eye to that. Recognize what's there for you. Be warned, perhaps, but know that the future changes. And all you have any, any control over is your now moment, your present moment. Because we can dwell in the past and what? Regret. Regret. Or we go into the future and we worry, don't we? Have you ever heard a first-person account of a story that you were also in and you go, what? That's not how I saw it happen. And that's the past. Those are our memories that we all bring on how something happened. And, you know, some of us are to the point where we go, I have no recollection of that ever even happening in the first place. Made an impact on somebody else, and they remember it. So our memories are not real reliable, are they? And yet we want to go back and use that imagination and create and recreate those old stories and stay over in that past, as opposed to in this now moment, this now breath. Or we want to worry about the future. Worry, 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 what's going to happen? Oh, this could happen, that could happen. How many of those things have really happened in your life? How many of those things have really happened that you've worried about in your life? Come back in the now moment. I invite you this week to stay in the present moment and notice if it liberates you from your fear. Just staying present in the breath. Because as you take that in-breath and that out-breath, Nothing wrong, is there? There's nothing wrong. Number two, the biggest problem in the universe is that people won't help each other. The biggest problem in the universe is that people won't help each other. This was Anakin quoting back to his mother after he brought four strangers back to their house for dinner. She's like, what are you doing? He said, Mom, you always tell me the biggest problem in the universe is that people won't help each other. I'm helping these folks. She's like, okay. So I thought about that statement. I thought, is that really true? So as I observed during the week around me and things that were happening, saw lots of examples where, yes, it is true. It is true. People will step over a piece of garbage. They will not hold a door. They just don't take opportunities to help. And yet, two weeks ago, remember our monsoon during the day that we had? I was driving home. Streets were flooding. 
People were stopping in their cars, getting out in the rain and the flooded streets to move debris out of the roadways. Not, not first responders, not the police or the fire. These were just people like you and me. And I thought, yeah, they're still good people. They're still helpful, selfless people out there. So I don't think that that is a 100% pure state, true statement. So our practice this week is to notice the opportunities for you to help another. To notice opportunities as you walk through your day. To make that extra little step, that little extra effort to help someone. Or the environment, or the planet. Number three, Master Yoda. He was in this one also. And uh, he says to young Anakin, they're doing, interviewing him to see if he qualifies for Jedi training. And he's talking to him about, he says, um, we can see your thoughts. Are, are you afraid? And he says, I think you're afraid of losing your mother. And he goes, well, of course I am. I'm a nine-year-old boy. Of course I am. And he responds, fear is the path to the dark side. Fear leads to anger, anger leads to hate, and hate leads to suffering. Would you agree? Yeah, we can see that path, can't we? We can see that path. It sounds very Buddhist, particularly in the way he talks. It sounds very Buddhist. But it also sounds true for us. It also sounds true for us. And I think I've shared with you before my tool for overcoming anger in particular if I'm in a situation where I'm feeling anger come up, I step back and go, what am I afraid of in this moment? Because I know that before the anger, the fear has to be there. So I have to ask myself and go back behind that anger, diffuse the anger to ask, what am I afraid of? Am I feeling, not being, right? I'm not being, but am I feeling like I'm being attacked? Am I feeling like I'm being discounted, discarded? something else. What is the fear that I'm feeling in that moment? Perhaps I'm reflecting back on something that's happened before and I'm going back into the past and saying, oh, when this happens or this is said, this means this and this is going to happen next. Ever do that? Yeah, we do, don't we? We take our previous experience, we project it into the future. But Holmes reminds us that Principles not bound by precedent. Principles not bound by precedent. So this week, notice your emotions. Notice your emotions when they come up and ask yourself, what am I afraid of right now? What is the fear behind this right now? So as we wrap up today, I've got some more questions for you. More things to ponder, like you don't have enough to ponder yet. What phantom menace might you be dealing with in your life? Remember the phantom menace in this movie is the dual person of the emperor. He was a senator, highly respected and regarded. He was the emperor of evil on the other side and the puppet master of the whole attacking party and so forth. Where is that showing up for you? Are you worrying about the future, regretting the past? Blaming someone or making excuses to offload responsibility, perhaps. How can you use your Jedi skills to overcome that menace in your life? I want to close with a final quote by Ernest Holmes, our founder, where he tells us that the individual who has the most power is the one who has the greatest re realization of the divine presence and to whom this means the most as an active principle in their life. It sounds like the force, doesn't it? We all need more backbone and less wishbone. That's earnest. More, more doing than hoping. And there's something which waits only your recognition to spring into being, bringing with it all the power in the universe. Bringing with it into your being is all the power in the universe. So peace and blessings to each of you this week. May the force be with you. So it is.
So I want to thank everyone for being with us today. And um, if you were with us for the first time, we again welcome you. Hope you found us to your liking. And there is another gift that awaits you in the lobby at our uh, guest services table where they will um, welcome you and give you a gift of appreciation for taking time out of your Sunday morning to be with us. So we really appreciate it. And I'd invite you now to join me in prayer if you would. How good it is to recognize that there is only one power, one presence, one force in the universe, one energy in this universe that we call God. We call it spirit. We call it the essence and presence and life itself. We know it is love. We know it is peace and harmony. We know it is all of the goodness that there is, was, and ever shall be. All of that is here now present in this room and in through and as me as an individualized expression of it as well as in through and as each of us that is sitting here today. For we are all unique and magnificent expressions of that one energy, that one power, that one presence. And so from that place, I speak my word for and about each of us, knowing, claiming, and accepting that as we step powerfully into our access to this thing we call the call spirit, or the force in our movie titles, we recognize that it is that one power that it is, is inherent within all. It is that one energy of life. And energy is never destroyed. It is only remodeled, changed in some way. I know for anyone that has anything on their heart today that they are seeking prayer around, prayer support, prayer of joy, whatever that might be, that as they lift that into their consciousness, into their heart in this moment, we bless it, knowing that it is healed, revealed, clarity, whatever the need might be. It is fulfilled in this moment with love and with joy, with peace and with harmony. And how grateful I am for this knowing. Grateful for the manifestation of the prayer. Grateful for knowing that this is true, that we are all in this oneness and this wholeness of the divine life. As I just let this go, I let it be, I place it into the activity of mind, into the action of law, accepting it is already done. The word spoken is the word made manifest. And we affirm it today by saying, and so it is.